put in after we get started. Um, so let's see. said I got a fellowship grant with Senya to do this research and I basically didn't know anything about it before I started because Senya came up to me in class and she's like have you heard of the cartonera movement and I was like um no <laughs> and she said all right well I think it's something that you'd really be interested in it's a new movement that started in the early 2000s and they've really taken off and I think you would do really well researching this movement so I did a little research into it before I left. I proposed, I wrote my proposal in 2011 and got submitted the grant in 2012. And I decided to do research on Sarita Cartonera, which is stationed in Lima, because I knew that I would be studying in Lima for a year. So I knew that that would work the best for me, because I'd be able to do an extended period of time of research to get a really, really good idea of what a cartonera is and how it develops through time. And the interesting about Sarita is that it, as it says, this was my research proposal, my abstract. Sarita had, a, come, had some problems at the beginning. It was the second cartonera that ever came to be. So first was Eloisa Cartonera, which came to be in Buenos Aires, Argen in Argentina. And that came to be because there were a lot of economic struggles in the early 2000s because banking, like the banking system crashed. And so they needed to establish some sort of absolute way of creating a system that people could still appreciate culture at low prices because a lot of people were suffering from those economic crises. So Eloisa came about, about and then Sarita decided that it was going to start up. And Sarita started up in 2004, but sadly in 2010, they had to enter a period of incertitude because they didn't really have enough funding. And I 
went there because I knew by what Ksenia told me they were coming back in 2011. They came back, they published, and they were tr trying to push it forward, but I'll tell you exactly how that went because it was a little rickety from time to time and it's still trying to push forward but it's having some difficulties. All right, so as I mentioned, there were some economic difficulties. Basically, the entire economic system in Argentina was destroyed. It was really undermined and people were losing their jobs, people were losing their money, families couldn't provide for their, for their children. And so people turned to a sort of creative source to generate income. And they saw that in recycling. So what people would do would be they'd go out at night when they weren't working and they would find cardboard or other recyclable materials and they would resell them to be reused. And Eloisa Cartonera and the founders discovered this and they thought, well, we can take advantage of that and we can create literature from the recycled goods. We can buy them at an elevated price so the people don't have as many economic issues. And on top of that, we can resell the books that we make from the cardboard and recycled materials for the people who can't afford it. So it's just all to help people who can't access literature for a low price. They also, they were a nonprofit organization, so they had jobs, but most of them were volunteer jobs. So they would be family members, the cartoneros themselves, or people who would just volunteer. And they would come in, they'd give them the jobs with no expectation of payment, and even the founders didn't have any expectation of payment. And it was completely self-sustaining. So what they made was made from the profit they got in the books, no profit, all self-sustaining, and that's how it's existed until today. And they've had over a, a hundred published books. So I wrote here that, this is actually me who said this, Eloisa soon became a sociocultural and economic phenomenon to find the stereotypical mold of the neoliberal publishing industry. An ambitious literature students, Milagro Salda, Salariaga and Tanya Sil Silva imitated the unique layout, adapting it to Peruvian circumstances. So two women who had recently graduated from the University of San Marcos in Lima, the first one, Salda Arriaga, discovered in just in a random magazine that she was reading, she was reading through it and she saw, oh, Eloisa Cartonera, what is this? I find this extremely interesting because she was a literature student. So the idea of facilitating access to literature really appealed to her. And she went over to her friend, Tania Silva, and she said, I think that we should really look into this. I think that we could really make something of this in Lima. It's just starting. There isn't too much of a foundation for what exactly it is. So we have the crea creativity to expand upon it and see what we can do for Lima. So she and Sil Silva decided to do some postgraduate research and write a thesis on it. But while they were doing that, they realized we don't just want to do research. We actually want to found, found our own. And they founded as a hobby, just as a hobby, a publishing organization, not a company, that's important, an organization. And that's when Sarita started, it started in 2004. Um, first it started, like I said, with two co-founders, Silva and Salariaga. Salariaga really pushing it forward, Silva agreeing to do it with her. And then they, they knew that they had the capability to edit and to push forward the literary aspect, so review the literature, know what they wanted to publish, but they weren't too confident in the layout. They thought, we can't, you know, we're not art majors and we're not journalism majors, so we don't know exactly how to publish things, how to lay them out, so they found a friend. And they had a friend do it with them, but he only helped them for a few months and he couldn't for any longer than that. So when they came back from a trip to Buenos Aires to visit, um, the Eloisa Cartonera to really found a relationship with them, a professional relationship to promote their development. They came back, found out that he couldn't help. His name was Cesar Vega, Julia Cesar Vega. And they, they, you know, they said, thank you for helping as long as you could. And they found another friend who said, I'll help do the things that he did. His name was Jaime Vargas Luna, and some of you might actually know him because he came here and I think he's working on his PhD now. He did his master's here and now he's working on his PhD and he's a TA, so he teaches some classes. Um, so 
some of the difficulties that they faced when they went to, they started founding, they realized literature is not really popular in Peru. Literature doesn't, especially in Lima, which is the capital, you'd think that of anywhere there, there would be literature in Lima. But there wasn't. And the problem with that was, was that in the early 2000s, in 2004, there was a favoring of publishing already known authors. So you'd have really popular Latin American and Iberian authors that they would publish because the publishing companies knew, we're gonna get money for this. If we publish people that we've never heard of before, we might not get money. And we're not gonna do that because we want money. So they avoided publishing unknown authors and because of that, debatably, there was a lack of popularity in reading because some of these authors wrote at a level that some people wouldn't be able to understand. Not saying that they wouldn't be able to eventually, but they weren't prepared to. So despite the fact that it was interesting, they might not purchase it. And also, additionally, the education in Peru, it falters in some areas. And literary education is really, really weak, which I'll cover more. So actually, I was actually very shocked to hear this, but in 2004, less, uh, uh, an individual would read less than one book per year, even people included in the academic arena, which is incredible if you think about what we're required to read, the idea that they wouldn't even read a, one book was very, very shocking. And in, in addition to that, in a city of over seven million people at the time, there were only 20 bookstores. That was all. And 47% of individuals did not understand what they were reading, no matter the level. So in order to deal with these issues, Sada Riaga, Silva, and Vargas Luna decided, we need to tackle this. We need to tackle this somehow, but how do we do it? Education is a huge arena that we can't just insert ourselves into, but we need to do it in a way that we can. So they created LUMPA, which stands for Libros Un Modelo Para Armar, which means basically, we're gonna give you some books and we're gonna suit you up to be able to read. All right, so they created LUMPA, and LUMPA only was in and out. It wasn't really firm. It was in and out for two years between 2005 and 2007. And just like the other, the problems that caused Saritas fall, there wasn't enough funding, advertising. There just wasn't enough knowledge or support for Lumpa. So it ended in 2007, which really showed the same path that Sarita was taking because it also suffered from the same problems. And in 2010, like I said, they entered a period of incertitude. And Santa Riaga, who was still really passionate about it because this was her idea, it was her baby, she wasn't willing to give up. And so even though she couldn't dedicate all her time to finding somebody to take over, she thought, I can present this idea periodically to students. And I'm going to go into different universities and see if anybody will pick up my idea. And uh, an undergraduate student, her name was Alejandra Sanchez, who graduated a few years ago, actually, she decided this is something that I'm interested in. And she had heard about it before, but her friend, Renzo Farge, had not. And Salda Riaga and Sanchez together explained to him exactly what this idea was and the economic and so social aspects of something so strong. And he decided, I want to work with them. This seems really, really awesome. So Sanchez and Farhi were working together for a year in two th between 2010 and 2011 to try to revive Sarita. But then Sanchez decided that she was going to go and pursue her own interests in getting a master's and doing other academic and professional things. So she ducked out and left Farhi to really command the entire publishing organization. So. I will explain their maintenance and expansion of the goals that they had, which I'll also explain since most of you probably aren't familiar. And I'll talk about whether it's really been revived or not. So before when Sarita existed, at the beginning, Salda Riaga and Silva decided they did not want a hierarchy. Sarita Cartonera was about including everybody. They wanted to include the entire community 
parents, children, teachers. They wanted everyone to be included, and they wanted everyone to have a stay. They didn't want it to be like a company. They didn't call themselves owners. They called themselves co-founders and editors because they wanted to make it known that they weren't trying to control everything, and they wanted input. So they decided that they weren't going to have a hierarchy, but between, amongst themselves, they would split the responsibilities, and they would delegate in a way which kind of created a hierarchy because what they would do is they'd have the volunteers or they'd have the paid cartoneras, cartoneros, the people who collected the cardboard, and they would train them to develop and fabricate the books, and then they would pay them. So there was a financial hi hierarchy, and in addition, the cartoneras, the, while they were working there, they didn't really have a say in how things were done. Um, now, they're, it's the same. There isn't a, de a definitive hierarchy, and Renzo wants le communal leadership, but the problem with that is Renzo is the only person, really, who's working with that right now. There aren't other people who are dedicated to it full time. There are a couple people who help periodically. Victor Vimos and Julián César Dan Daniel Rodriguez, really long name. And they help every now and then, but it's extremely, extremely periodic. It's not, it's not set. And so they aren't really workers, they're associates. Uh, he wants to evolve the community as well, and I think he actually wants to expand it a bit more than they expanded it in the beginning, because he really wants to make sure there's a revolving community that comes in and has input, whereas they would appeal to a group of people before, and then they would kind of just leave it, and they would just pick a group to a group to a group, and then they wouldn't like integrate the ideas as much, and that was really, really problematic. Um, it's the same thing, it's a nonprofit organization. They don't, he doesn't want there to be any profit. What it is, is it's gonna be the same as Eloisa, where they'll fund themselves, they'll have, they'll create their books, they'll publish their books with the money that they earn from the revenue from book sales. And he recognizes that some things that, that we're lacking, that they need, are legal and marketing hierarchy. So basically, they'll have the cartoneras, cartoneros in working like they did before. So the cartonera, cartoneros will contribute in the way that they did publishing the books and designing the books, but they won't have any input. But there will also be legal and financial and marketing aids. So he's hoping to eventually hire people to help him with that, to really spur it on. But again, they won't have any more control than what they have knowledge in. So Lumpa, which was really what made me interested in Sarita from the beginning, was extremely, extremely important. Lumpa was not planned at all. Sarita did not plan on creating Lumpa at the beginning. It was unplanned, but it came to be out of necessity. And like I just described, there was really no literary culture in Peru before. And they realized through their book sales, the three original co-editors, that they weren't reaching their target audience. Their target audience were the people who didn't really get to appreciate literary culture. They were the people who didn't have a very good education and the people who struggled every day to survive economically. But the problem was, because those people didn't already have a founding base for literary interest, they weren't going to take advantage of it. And they discovered that the people who were purchasing their books were collectors or students, so people who already had an interest. And they decided, we'll create Lumpa, because we want to go and we want to reach out to the people who didn't really get to see the things that we wanted them to see and experience the literature that they don't ever get to see. So doing that, they realized a lot of people go to school. Most people go to school. So we can tackle this through education. And in education, there's a literary absence, like I said. And that really spawned from the fact that the Ministry of Education formed their syllabus based on a very militaristic approach due to a very long history in Peru that I can't cover, but they, they were very 
step one, step two, step three, there's no room for creativity and you don't get to decide what you want to do. It's the basic idea of here's the character, the character wants this, the character does this to get what he wants, and then the character gets it, period. It's just not, it's not really looking into literature. It's just seeing it from the very superficial point of view. So Lumpa wanted to create an interest with, that wasn't there because of this poor education. And they decided, we're going to imbue interest where it wasn't previously, because if we don't, then these people are never going to really understand what we're about. They're never really going to push themselves to reach a level that they could have never reached before. So they developed and honed a new methodology. But when I say developed and honed, I mean that very loosely. Because they, they didn't really have experience with education. So they tried to, as much as they could, develop it and understand that we're going to research some educational concepts and we're going to try to apply them to the workshops because we want to give workshops to instructors so they then can teach the students and we're going to do it in a way that they can understand. So they took the methodology that they created for a few months and they presented it, their first workshop, to a whole bunch of teachers and professors and they realized the teachers and professors are not understanding anything that we came up with because they don't understand the educational concepts. So we got to take this back to square one and we have to start all over again. So they redeveloped it the same way that you would imagine teaching to someone who has no experience at all. They just really made it hands-on. They made it interactive so it would be interesting because it's, in my opinion, better to learn through experience instead of just sitting and reading. They wanted people to touch the books, read the books, come back to the books. So what they did was they would have a small book for the workshop. They'd have the teachers read it together. Then each teacher would take a character and they'd draw the character. How they appear the character in the book, appear to see the character in the book. And then after they were done, all of the teachers would come together and they would compare what they had. And they'd explain why they thought the character looked like this their personality, their physical traits, what they did in the book that made them see them this way. And if they had disagreements, they'd go back to the text and they'd discuss it. So it really gave this idea of interacting with the text instead of just being a spectator and having no say. It really allowed them to develop creatively the ideas of what literature really meant. It, literature isn't something you just read and you take it in. It's something that you develop in your mind. It's a, it's a process of creativity like any sort of artwork. And they wanted the teachers to understand that so the teachers could pass that on to the children. So that's exactly what they did. They were teaching instructors because they re recognized that if they just taught to students, the students wouldn't be able to spread it. So the instructors year after year would be able to spread this. And they created associations with specific schools, one called Colegio del Mercedario, and they worked with it for a few months and they saw the program implemented and it worked. And the students became interested, the students developed their own books, instead of just drawing person people, I was gonna say personajes, which is Spanish, but <laughs> they, would, they would draw characters and then they would develop their own books afterwards. And they became so interested that they implemented a 15 minute reading session before school, which is something that the students wanted. It was a student's idea. And that's a really, really big deal to have students take that initiative. So they had that association with the schools, but they lost contact because they didn't have the financial support to be able to keep contact. OK, and Lumpa now. Lumpa in itself, with that name, does not exist. Uh, Farhi recognizes that Though the problems with literacy and literary comprehension have improved in the past decade because of organizations like Enseña Peru, which wants seven out of eight children to be able to read and understand what they're reading in Peru, they haven't gotten rid of all of the problems. So there's still a necessity for this educational program. And he recognizes that just like before, there will be controversy with the Ministry of Education because they really haven't overhauled their system. They're still very militaristic and they have expectations about how things are exactly supposed to be. They don't refer to the teachers. 
to understand the progress of the students. They say, you're going to do this, and we don't really care what you have to say because this has worked, so we're going to keep doing this. And they, <laughs> because they're doing that, Farhe recognizes that they really need to gain some sort of support within education before he can really push it forward. And meanwhile, because it's going to take a lot of effort, he's just going to expand literature to the unreached population. So same as before, people who are less financially stable, they're going to go out to the outside districts in Lima, and they're going to work with the people who don't have as rich of an education. Right now, he doesn't have a methodology. For a good reason, he doesn't have the time or money to support developing a methodology. But he did a really interesting workshop in Barrios Altos, which is one of the conos, the poor outside districts of Lima. And he, what he did, which I love this, and I think this is fantastic, he went in during a huge festival. He attracted all the students, come, come, come over, I want to teach you about literature. I know that it seems super boring because you guys don't like to read. But come over here and trust me, you're not going to regret this. So he had a small group of 10 to 15 children, and he said, all right, so you guys see books and stories, and they have hard covers, and you think, oh, I don't know anything about this. I don't really care. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that literature, you can own literature. You can make it your own. So what they did is they went out, and they found recycled goods themselves. They found cardboard. They found plastic. And when they went back to the workshop, the table, they created these little dolls of all the recycled goods that they found. And each ch child created a doll. And from that creation, they wrote a story. And they saw that they could create something completely on their own, in their mind. And that's what every author does when they write literature. So it gives them this interior appreciation of something that they didn't understand the process of before. And he, has an, he had another planned workshop this year. And I asked him if he was going to give it. He's going to give it to university students because he thinks that's a really important aspect of it. Is said, I got a fellowship grant with Senya to do this research. I a master's degree in Russian literature and a PhD in archaeology. So I was just grilling her before our talk about, so where do you apply to graduate school? She's like, well, I'm just taking a little breather, so I'm getting a break here before um, moving on to her next step in her academic career. Um, when she was here at UW, she was a safe walker and dispatcher. She tutored Spanish for the University Housing Residence Hall. She also volunteered for uh, the bridge program as a partner until she left to travel in Lima, Peru. And um, Bree and one of our former um, director for Latin American Studies are programming and have other ideas for how we can improve things. There are, are hard copy surveys there and some pencils. Otherwise, if you visit our homepage, uh, right on the homepage, there's a link and you can do it electronically. So um, we would love to see that. So, um, I will move on here. So um, Gabrielle Corp is a recent graduate of our program, as well as um, she has a degree in anthropology in Spanish and Russian, which is an interesting mix of um, <laughs> majors. And um, her plans going forward are to uh, also um, over there in the corner we have a list of our upcoming um, lecture series. Well, for the remainder of the semester, the lectures we have for our Tuesday lunchtime. Um, we also have a sign-in sheet if you're interested in being 
added to our listserv. We send out an event calendar once a week of all of our events and other things dealing with our region that are happening around Madison. Um, and lastly, we are collecting um, survey responses for all of our events, or trying to for all of our events for this semester, just to get a feel for how people are um, 